This video should be watched after you have finished reading Chapter 3 of The Great Gatsby. The commentary is suitable for high school students of English. Here are a few questions to see whether you remember the details of the chapter. The first question, who invites Nick to the party? The second, who does Nick meet at the party? Three, what does Nick call the man in the library? Number four, where does Gatsby tell Nick he recognizes him from? Fifth question, what attribute of Gatsby's does Nick comment on at length? Number six, who does Gatsby want to speak to in private? And lastly, what happens at the end of the party? At last, we get to attend one of Gatsby's famous parties. Well, through the eyes of our narrator and Gatsby's next door neighbor, Nick Carraway. The first few pages of this chapter is a description of the party. Fitzgerald wants us to visualize these as ostentatious, flamboyant events with all kinds of food, people, colors, cocktails, and music. Nick Carraway says, in his blue gardens, men and girls came and went like moths among the whisperings and the champagne and the stars. This is a beautiful introduction to Gatsby's parties. Like moths to a bright light, Gatsby's mansion is continuously lit as a beacon. We understand this is not just for the party guests, but also a bright light shining for Daisy. At these parties, you will find gossip, whispering, alcohol, champagne, and dreams, stars. Fitzgerald wants to maintain Gatsby's romantic vision, so he uses careful diction to evoke that dreamy, beautiful quality. The image of the moths being drawn to the light is particularly evocative. Of course, we all know what happens to moths that fly too closely to the light. Could this be foreshadowing? Do you remember this book jacket from the pre-reading activity? These parties start in the morning out on Gatsby's beach the guests spend the day out in the sun playing and afterwards they head to the house to dance and drink the whole weekend. At high tide in the afternoon, I watched his guests diving from the tower of his raft or taking the sun on the hot sand of his beach while his two motorboats slit the waters of the sound, drawing aquaplanes over cataracts of foam. The motorboat would have this kind of white foam in the wake behind it. Here, Fitzgerald describes it as a cataract of foam. This ties into the imagery of eyes, sight, spectacles that we are coming to expect. Now, cataracts is a disease of the eyes that makes it difficult to see clearly. Who isn't seeing clearly? Is this about the guests or Gatsby? Fitzgerald wants to show the romance of Gatsby's parties, but he also wants to show the excess, the waste. He gives us specific details, colors and numbers. Everything is bigger and more expensive. Gatsby isn't being boastful, but he is showing off his money. Here's a gorgeous Fitzgerald sentence. This single sentence has five parts. Each part builds on the last. The bar floats the alcohol, which causes the laughter and innuendo that are met by women who are too drunk to remember. 
This careful and deliberate syntax highlights the emptiness, the superficiality of this lifestyle. Read the passage on the slide. Read it twice. It's beautiful. Now, compare it to this sentence from chapter two about Myrtle Wilson. Her laughter, her gestures, her assertions became more violently affected moment by moment. And as she expanded, the room grew smaller around her until she seemed to be revolving on a noisy, creaking pivot through the smoky air. There are some similar constructions like minute by minute and moment by moment. This passage in main idea is the same as the sentence about Myrtle, except here the tone is more romantic. When Myrtle is the center of attention, it's painful. But when these confident girls become the center of a group, it's a triumph, it's joyous. It's okay for the rich to act like this, but not the lower classes. Fitzgerald does this with his attention to diction. It's a major theme throughout the novel. If you have money, you can get away with just about anything. And the word prodigality, well, that means wasteful spending. In the 1920s, the idea of celebrity was brand new. The Hollywood Land sign was erected in 1923. This is the dawn of a new flamboyant and decadent age. Frisco was a well-known jazz dancer. Gilda Gray is mentioned here as a famous actress. People are thrilled to see her perform at Gatsby's. But is that the Gilda Gray? No, that's her understudy. She's the wannabe Gilda Gray. The same way that Myrtle is the wannabe Daisy. The Follies was a troupe of dancing girls who performed in Broadway theatres and were very popular in the 1920s. This paragraph ends with a four word sentence that ignites the action of this chapter. The party has begun. Of course, in the 1920s, the party had begun as well as the parties in Hollywood. I recommend that you look for this podcast online in which a young Hollywood scriptwriter, Frederica Segor, tells us about the debauched and decadent parties which she attended in the 1920s. It's fascinating listening, with details of the sexual exploitation of women in the fledgling film industry. This podcast proves that wild parties were not invented by your generation, nor by your parents' generation. Fitzgerald compares Gatsby's mansion to an amusement park. In another chapter, he'll call it Coney Island, a popular amusement park in New York. What do Gatsby's parties and amusement parks have in common? How do people act at an amusement park? And why does Fitzgerald use this analogy over and over again? These references should remind you of the original book jacket. What do you think of Gatsby's guests so far? Who attends these parties? How is it, as Nick says, that they just went there? It's obvious that our narrator, Nick Carraway, is a means to an end for Gatsby. Why else would he receive an invitation to one of these parties? Nick is clearly out of place, dressed in his flannels, not a dinner suit, and ill at ease among swirls and eddies of people he didn't know. Jordan and Nick wander about the party. 
Notice that they descend into the garden. Jordan's arm is golden at Gatsby's. She's ornamental. She's a piece of jewelry. And did you note the color references? They're all over the place. What do you associate with these colors? Why is Nick dressed in white? The same color that Daisy was wearing when we met her for the first time. And is Jordan a golden girl? What could that mean? At the party, Nick and Jordan sit with a group who gossip about Gatsby. Nick is looking for Gatsby, but we come to find out that no one else has seen him either. The party goers have plenty of gossip about Gatsby. See some of the rumors which are highlighted in green here. In your notebook, you should keep a list of all the rumors that you've heard about Gatsby. There's also the story about the dress. Apparently, Gatsby replaced a guest's torn dress with one from a designer for $265. That's way more than $3,000 in today's money. The store Quarier is fictitious, but supposedly inspired by Cartier. The word croire is French for to believe or to think. Do you agree with the guest who says that there is something funny about a party host that would go to such expense? Well, it certainly adds to the mystery that surrounds Jay Gatsby. Owl Eyes is one of those literary characters that everyone remembers from The Great Gatsby, even though he only has three scenes throughout the book. Nick and Jordan come to the library and find a mostly drunk, owl-eyed man. What is evoked by the use of the moniker Owl Eyes? What do we associate with owls and glasses? He's in the library with the books. What do these clues lead us to believe about our eyes? That he's wise? That he's educated? That he's able to see things that we can't? In some of Shakespeare's plays, when a character loses his mind, they're able to see more clearly, to see the truth. Lady Macbeth and Ophelia from Hamlet are both examples of this. In Gatsby's universe, there is no losing of the mind that brings clarity, but there is drunkenness. And because our eyes is so drunk, he sees truth when others cannot. By the way, the picture on the slide is not of the character our eyes. It's a picture of the psychoanalyst Sigmund Freud. Since Freud and psychoanalysis were part of the birth of modernism, it's tempting to think that Fitzgerald had Freud in mind when he created the character of Owl Eyes. Freud's theory, in very simple terms, says that we don't have control over our own fate. We are controlled by our id, our superego. Hmm. More food for thought when we contemplate what happens to Gatsby. How much control did he really have over the events that are about to unfold in the novel? In one of my favorite moments in the novel, Owl Eyes reveals that the books are real. What did he and you expect? Did he think that they'd be fake? Our Eyes calls Gatsby a Belasco. Now, David Belasco was a well-known theatre director known for his realistic sets. A Gatsby party is the party in all of literature post-1925. Anytime you see a party in a novel, you should wonder if Gatsby is being evoked and what that could mean. Look at the diction here. What is Fitzgerald doing? Is this supposed to be romantic? Or is it just supposed to look romantic? Look at the words backward, graceless, and 
tortuously. These are not words that imply that the dancers are having a good time. And look at the highlighted words in this extract. Again, poetry to describe something simple like the look of the water under the moon. I hope that you are starting to appreciate Fitzgerald's writing genius. In literature, it's common for characters to have a moment just before their lives are fundamentally changed. Seconds before Gatsby talks to Nick, he feels the importance of what's to happen. He is also drunk. In this first exchange between Nick and Gatsby, the two find common ground in having both served in World War I. Nick makes mention of wet, grey little villages in France. This reminds us of two facts. The war is just four years ago, and the war in Europe had been brutal, with villages decimated. They were wet and grey. These are not romantic descriptions. Nick and Gatsby must have seen some terrible things as infantry soldiers. As with so many tragedies, the title character is introduced to us in a roundabout way. Think Macbeth in Shakespeare's play. In the 2013 movie version of The Great Gatsby, the director, Baz Luhrmann, is able to capture the comic moment of the scene as I think Fitzgerald intended it. The scene is written to keep Gatsby hidden so that there's a dramatic reveal. And there's an irony that this consummate host would be a stranger to his guests. Watch the clip freely available on YouTube to see how Baz Luhrmann filmed the reveal of the title character and to see the origin of this now widely used meme. Four sentences so important that they get their own slide. There's perhaps no more important quote from The Great Gatsby than this one. Nick recalls the moment Gatsby smiled at him for the first time, and he is transfixed. What is eternal reassurance? Forever hopeful? Forever reaching out of the light? Going into eternity with a kind of dream that changes your life? The word you, or variations of the word, is used 12 times. Notice the capitalized you. This isn't about Gatsby, it's about you, the reader. It's about how Gatsby makes you feel. It's about the taker, not the giver. It's a nice sentiment about Gatsby that he has this effect on people. But it isn't about him as a person. Gatsby is still not a man. He's an ideal, he's a dream, he's a concept. And it is this concept, this idea, this dream that changes you, not Gatsby. And the use of the word understand, it's used twice in the first and last sentence in this passage. Gatsby understands us. Gatsby knows what we need and who we want to be in a perfect world. Once again, Nick and Jordan are gossiping about Gatsby. Notice that Jordan says he's just a man named Gatsby. She's a little bored with the whole mystery and she brings up Oxford. The question persists, did Gatsby attend Oxford? Why? When we get to the end of the novel, we'll see that Jordan's statement that he's just a man named Gatsby is probably one of the most accurate assessments of the title character. Also curious is Jordan's most famous line at the end. I like large parties, they're so intimate. At small parties, 
there isn't any privacy. We know to look deeper at it because of the juxtaposition used by Fitzgerald, large and intimate compared to small and private. And maybe this is also about Gatsby. Maybe Nick should be minding his own business. Where does Gatsby come from? Both of these options have Gatsby coming from water. The swamp would be far less sophisticated, but preferable to him drifting in from nowhere. Water is almost always a symbol of life, birth and rebirth. Why does Nick say that he could see nothing sinister about Gatsby? What did our eyes expect of the books? What did Jordan expect? How is this different from the reality of Gatsby? Does he meet their expectations? And Gatsby's alone. He has no girl with him at his own party. And by the way, Vladimir Tostov's musical composition, Jazz History of the World, is a fictional piece created by Fitzgerald for this novel. Automobiles are symbolic of the industrial age and a time of prosperity in the United States. In the novel, Gatsby's car is emblematic of his status. But in chapter three, there's a car accident at the end of the party. The diction evokes death, but no one dies. It's an example of foreshadowing, as another accident will take place later in the novel. We have already heard Nick talking about how Gatsby's house is like an amusement park. Here's a picture of Coney Island in the 1920s. Note the wafer of a moon over the park with the word Luna. It's reminiscent of the description of Gatsby's house at the end of the party. At the end of the party, Nick notes Gatsby's emptiness and isolation. The image of him, of his figure waving goodbye, is one repeated throughout the novel. Gatsby smiles and Nick is the last to go. This is also the same at the end of chapters six and nine. Nick is always the last to go. It becomes Nick's burden to tell Gatsby's story. Nick and Jordan spend time together, and as he spends more time with her, he sees her as dishonest. This is because she's been accused of cheating in a golf game. She was cleared. It appears as though people were paid off, proving that rich people can buy their own justice. But still, Nick takes the time to judge her, and by extension, all women. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Nick and Jordan talk about her poor driving. He tells her that she's a rotten driver. And this gives us another important quote. I hate careless people. That's why I like you. The notion that some people are careless is central to the novel. Nick tells us about his girlfriend back home. Clearly they have ended their relationship, but since Nick still signs his letters love, he feels obligated to officially break it off before he enters into a romance with Jordan. Well, does Nick even like Jordan? It doesn't seem like it. Does Nick like anyone besides Gatsby? And what to make of this comment from Nick about his girlfriend with a moustache of perspiration Look at this picture of Suzanne Lenglen, a famous tennis player from France in the 1920s. If Fitzgerald fashioned Jordan after a famous golfer, maybe he was thinking of a famous tennis player 
who's a champion, but not necessarily that feminine. As a result of his admission about the girlfriend back home, Nick tells us that he has a cardinal virtue. Is Nick one of the few honest people? Well, he wants us to think he is, for sure. We've already established that he's an unreliable narrator. We'll have to see how the plot develops as Nick reveals more of Gatsby's tragic story. Do you remember those questions? How did you do? Gatsby invited Nick to the party, sending a manservant across the lawn with a formal printed invitation. Nick meets all the glitzy folk at the party, including Jordan Baker, but the most important character is obviously the host himself, Jay Gatsby. Nick refers to the man in the library as Owl Eyes, which is an obvious link to the image of the billboard of Dr. T.J. Eckelberg in the Valley of the Ashes from the previous chapter. Gatsby thinks he might have bumped into Nick in France when they were both in the US infantry divisions during the Great War, what we have come to know as World War I. Nick believes that Gatsby has the propensity for hope and optimism. Gatsby asks to speak to Jordan Baker in private. As everyone is leaving the party in a drunken state, there's an accident in which a guest's car crashes into the wall. It's an example of foreshadowing when everyone assumes that Owl Eyes is the driver of the car only for him to tell everyone that he wasn't driving and the accident was not his fault. And that's it for chapter three. A huge thank you to my American colleague, Amy Goldman, a high school English teacher who generously allowed me to use some of her work as I prepared this presentation. If you have any queries, please contact me at the email address that you see on the screen.